Welcome to part two of module two. Here we're talking about administering progress monitoring measures with fidelity. So we're not going to administer them poorly, we are going to administer them with fidelity. So our objectives here are we're going to talk about learning how to administer and score early numeracy progress monitoring measures. We're going to administer and score computation measures, and we're also going to administer and score concepts and applications measures. So where are we? I asked that question a little bit earlier. Here you can see we are thinking about our DBI framework. And I'll use my arrows that really uh, this part of the module, we're focusing on those progress monitoring ovals. So we're thinking about what measures that we can administer that help us progress monitor students and how we're gonna score those measures in order to make decisions about whether students are responsive or non-responsive to intensive intervention. So with progress monitoring, the whole idea behind progress monitoring is that we're going to give students um, uh, very brief measures and I'm going to recommend on a weekly basis. And with these brief measures, we would give one in the first week and one in the second week and one in the third week. And then this collection of scores helps us learn whether the students are responding well to the intensive intervention or whether we need to do something differently within intensive intervention. So when we're thinking about progress monitoring, there are several different vocabulary terms that people might use to describe progress monitoring measures. I'm mostly gonna call these measures today, but people may call them progress monitoring tests or even progress monitoring probes. Um, but the idea, and I already talked about this on the previous slide, is that these are administered frequently. I'm going to say these should be administered weekly. And we're going to compare the scores from one week to the next to understand whether students are making mathematics growth that we deem appropriate. So when I'm thinking about finding progress monitoring measures, and I'll talk about how to find those in just a minute, I want you to locate measures that are reliable and valid. The reliability is really important here because I want you to choose forms that also are probes that also have alternate forms. So the reliability, I want one form to be uh, equitable to the, all the other forms. And I want these also to be valid. So are they actually testing what I would like them to test? Now you might say, Sarah, where can I find progress monitoring measures? And I would say, well, your first best bet is always to visit the National Center on Intensive Intervention. So this is a screenshot from their homepage in 2017. It might change a little bit in the future. But here, if I look here on this top bar, right here where it says tools chart, if you click on tools chart, um, there's a pull down menu that comes up and you can click on academic progress monitoring measures. And if you go there, then you can actually find a good starting list of academic progress monitoring measures that you, you may want to use. Now, um, later on in this, in this part of the module, you're going to spend some time with those tools chart. So if you wanna look at it now, that's great, but we're gonna have a workbook activity that's going to guide you through the tools chart in just, in just a little bit of time. But first I wanna talk about what are some of the, um, like the, uh, the most used progress monitoring measures that we see in mathematics. So for that, I can rely on this list. This comes from the National Center on Intensive Intervention for recommendations in terms of math progress monitoring measures. And the recommendations are for students that are performing at a kindergarten level. So those could be students that are in kindergarten or students that are working on kindergarten mathematics. We want to use some type of early numeracy measure. And so we're going to talk about all three of these. In grades one to two, or for students that are performing around a first or second grade math level, we're going to use a computation measure. And past grade three, so grades three through eight, we'd like to rely on some type of concepts and applications measure. Now these are recommendations. Yeah, you may not have a concepts and applications measure to use where you have a computation measure. So you may make decisions based on the availability of progress monitoring measures to you. Um, you also might think that a computation measure is more appropriate than a concepts and applications measure or vice versa. So these are just some general recommendations, but we are gonna focus on these five measures today. So we're gonna talk about number identification, quantity discrimination, missing number, computation, and concepts and applications. 
Now, when you're thinking about progress monitoring measures and which ones you should use, there are some considerations that I would like you to think about. So I want you to think about the skills that you want to measure. So whether they're age appropriate or grade appropriate. For a seventh grader, it's probably not appropriate to use number identification. Students are way beyond that. So that's kind of an exaggerated example, but you want to think like, is this appropriate? Is this an appropriate measure to use for the student that I am monitoring their progress? You want to think about the cost. Some of these measures are very inexpensive. Some are quite expensive. Um, you also want to think about how long it takes to administer these measures and the scoring time. Um, all of the ones that I'm going to show today uh, do have a relatively brief time for administration, and they're pretty easy to score. So those are some nice things to look for. We also want to think about um, how you're going to manage the data. So a lot of these progress monitoring measures have uh, software or um, online portals where you can enter the student's scores, and it gives you interpretations of the data. That's really nice. Sometimes that's a little bit expensive. You can also do the data management on your own. And then think about the rigor of the, of the measures that you're looking at. So are they reliable and valid, and do they have alternate forms? Alternate forms are very important because you're going to give this again and again and again, and you want to be able to understand that if you give a measure one week and a different measure the following week, that the scores between those two measures um, are pretty, going to be pretty similar, so they're going to be pretty reliable. So we're first going to talk about the early numeracy measures. So we're going to start out with measures that are for students that are not really ready to add and subtract yet. So they're really early numeracy skills that we would be working on and testing within stu for students within intensive intervention. So the first early numeracy measure that we're going to talk about today is number identification. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on this measure here, the student is going to identify written numbers for one minute. So this is just a sample. Um, if students were actually using this uh, exact measure, there's three pages of numbers that the student would read aloud for one minute. If the student is reading aloud, that means that this is an individually administered assessment. So it's you as the teacher or tutor sitting across or next to the student, and a single student is reading, whoops, reading these numbers aloud for one minute time. And as they read them aloud, there is a teacher's score sheet, and the teacher just marks whether the student said the number correctly or whether they didn't say it correctly. If you want to get um, a little bit beyond just correct and incorrect, you can also write um, the mistakes that students make, and that can be used within an error analysis to inform instruction at a later time. Now, when you're giving a measure like this number identification, there are some scoring considerations that we want to think about. So um, we're timing for one minute. So if a student makes a pause anywhere for like three or four seconds, you want them to go to the next item and you'll say, try this one. Um, we are in an assessment situation, so never correct errors, right? Assessment is just for getting information. It's not a teachable moment. Um, the teachers are going to score the task at the end of one minute. Do make sure that you uh, note how many items the student completed. And then the number of correct items that the student did in that one minute timing, that's going to be the student's score that will end up going on their graph. And we're going to talk about graphing just a little bit later here. So uh, this is an, one example of a number identification assessment. Um, these are some others that are out there. And so you can see that while they look a little bit different, the whole idea here is that students are just reading numbers aloud for one minute. Now I have a video of a, a tutor giving this assessment to a young student. Um, so this is our tutor, Urja, and she is working with this young boy, Sam. And she is going to administer the number identification assessment to Sam. So I show you this video. It's not no longer than two minutes, so that you can see that administration of the entire assessment is quite brief. And what you're going to see is she's going to do a few sample items with Sam, and then she's going to set her timer for one minute, and then he's going to read the numbers aloud as she uh, scores, the, scores the, the measure. So let's go ahead and watch what Urja does here. Look, look at the paper in front of you, okay? There are some numbers in the boxes, okay? You have to tell me what number is it. So Six. what number is it? Good. What number is Two. this? Good. What One, number is this? 44. Good. Okay. So now when I say begin, you have to tell me what numbers are there in these boxes, okay? Start from here and go across the page, okay? If you don't know any number, let me know. 
okay try each problem like around like this from your to your okay six four two hold on I'll, when i say start okay are you ready hold on okay start six four two nine sixteen five eighteen eight thirty nine eight twenty six zero eighteen thirty sixteen two eighteen no, I accidentally 94, 17, 22, 7, 64, 47, 9, 1, 3, 34, 24, 94, no, 95, 7. Turn on the page. I keep forgetting, like. That's fine. Try to start from here. 11, 63, 3, 49, 15, 20, 42, 14, 3, 0, 6, 11, 10, 4, 3, 13. Okay. All right, so what we can see is that Urja has the student looking at the student copy, and she has her own score sheet right here. Uh, one of the things that we did do for this video is I kind of wanted to see um, how easily easy it was for her to score uh, score the measure. Um, in a normal administration, you would probably have this on a clipboard so the student couldn't actually see it. And I don't think the uh, CM could see it much, but we wanted to show you how easy it was to administer this type of measure. You can also see that while Sam was um, <clears throat> was doing his one minute timing, um, he self corrected himself several times. When students do self correct, you take um, their self correction and you score that. So if they self corrected to a correct answer, that would be a correct response. Sometimes students correct to an incorrect answer, and so you would score that as an incorrect response. But overall, this measure is quite brief to administer. And now Urja would just count up the number of a number the number of numbers that Sam identified correctly in the one minute timing and then that would be Sam's score for this week and then next week she would come back and administer an alternate form of this assessment and then the number of correct numbers that student uh, that Sam identified that would go on his graph for week two and then we would do this on a weekly basis and we would look at Sam's graph after a number of weeks usually after six or eight or ten weeks and we would determine whether the intensive intervention that we're providing to Sam whether that's making his graph increase or is his graph stagnant? And if it's going to increase, we're going to continue with that intensive intervention. And if his growth is stagnant, we are going to adapt our intervention. We're going to do something a little bit different to really hope that Sam's scores pick up from there. So we just looked at number identification, which is one of the early numeracy measures. And that might be one that's appropriate for you to give to the student or students that you're working with within intensive intervention. But you could also consider using another type of early numeracy measure. So here is another example of an early numeracy measure. This one's called quantity discrimination. And in here, uh, on this assessment, the student orally identifies the greater number in a pair of numbers, and they do this for a one minute timing. So for example, here the student says, there, I found it finally, um, they look at this pair of numbers and they tell you the number that's greater. So the student would say five. Then the student moves to this pair of numbers and they tell you the greater number. The student would say three. Then they look at this pair and so on and so forth. And they'll do this for one minute always identifying the number that is greater. The scoring considerations for quantity discrimination are the same that we see for number identification, so I won't go over those here, but just to reiterate very quickly that whenever students make a pause for at least three to four seconds, ask them to go on to the next item. Now we see different versions of quantity discrimination out there on, on the progress monitoring market. Um, some of these measures involve pictorial representations and determining which quantity is greater. Here we see some other examples where students are presented with pairs of numbers and the students identify the greater number in the pair uh, in a one minute timing.
So now we're going to look at Urja. She's back working with Sam. We're going to see her administer this assessment. We're not actually going to, we're going to see how she introduces it to Sam. Sam's going to start and then we'll kind of uh, move to the end. But you can see how easy it is to administer this type of assessment and how uh, well the student does um, answering items about quantity discrimination. Okay, so look at this paper. In each row, there are some boxes with number in it, okay? You have to tell me which number is bigger, okay? So which number is bigger? Seven. Good. Which number is bigger? Six. Good. Which number Eight. is bigger? Eight. Okay. So now, when I say begin, you have to tell me which number is bigger, okay? Start from here and go across the page. And if you finish this page, go to the next one, okay? Try each problem, and if you don't know, let me know, okay? Do you have any questions? Do you want to begin? Hold on, let's see. Okay, start from your Five, seven, eight, eighteen, of course. Seven, eight, nine, sixteen, nine, eight, nineteen, one. Okay. All right, so Urja did a really nice job administering that quantity discrimination assessment to Sam. One of the things that I do want to make a note of and that we're going to talk about in other modules is mathematics language. So many people will say that instead of talking about bigger and smaller numbers, because bigger and smaller refer to size, we, we should talk about numbers that are greater and numbers that are less. So when I introduced quantity discrimination, I talked about students have to identify the greater number in the pair. Um, here, Urja was reading directly from the script that accompanies this assessment and it asked students to find the bigger number. So we actually asked her to retain that language so you could, um, we would retain the essence of the assessment and we wouldn't change the assessment script at all. Um, but it may be one of those things that you want to note to students is like when I think about bigger numbers, that's the number that's greater. So making sure that they understand that connection there. Now our last early numeracy measure that we're going to look at is missing number. So with missing number, this is an example missing number assessment, the student is going to identify the missing number within a sequence of numbers for one minute. Now, if we look at these sequences, students are presented with different types of sequences. So for this first one, we have three, four, five, and students would identify the missing number as six, and there the missing number is at the end of the sequence. But you'll see other examples where the missing number is within the sequence or even at the beginning of the sequence. Also note that not all sequences are sequences where we count by one. Here is a sequence where students are expected to count by fives. Um, here is a sequence where students are expected to count by tens. And I believe there are sometimes I will see sequences where students are expected to count by twos. The same scoring criteria hold true for, that for, hold true for quantity discrimination, also hold true for missing number. And here are some missing number examples from different progress monitoring companies. So here's an example. You can see um, students have to identify the missing number in a sequence of four numbers. In this example, students identify the missing number in a sequence of three numbers. But all of these are getting at students' understanding of numbers and where fa numbers fall uh, relative to other numbers. And really, it's testing students' understanding of numbers and how they fall on a number line. So now we're going to check out Urja. This time she's working with another student named Emma, and we're going to see how she administered this missing number uh, measure. Ready? Mm -hmm. okay. Look at the paper in front of you, okay? Each box has three numbers and a blank, okay? You have to tell me which number goes in the blank. Which number goes in the blank? We. Good. Which number goes in the blank over here? Two. Good. What about over here? Six. The number is 20. 5, 10, 15, 20. We're counting by 5. So what number? 20. Good. So when I say begin, you have to tell me what number goes in the blank, okay? Start from here and go across the page. Try each one. If you don't know any of the answer, let me know, okay? 
Do you have any questions? Do you want to begin? Okay. Okay, begin. What number goes in the blank? Nine. Good. What number goes in the blank? Try the next one. I gotta go to this one. Yeah. Six. Good. Try the next one. Over here. Two. Okay. Okay, we're done. Now notice one of the things there is that the student, um, Emma, uh, she uh, at one point was like, oh, am I here? So one of the things that might be helpful to do is to actually have a cover sheet and move it down the page as the student works on the different items. The one thing about progress monitoring is if you do some type of thing like that, so if you use a cover sheet, you need to make sure that you use a cover sheet every time you administer the measure because we want to be consistent not only with the measures that we're administering, but how we administer those measures. So if you do do anything like that, you want to make sure that you're going to do it the same way every time. So we've just watched three little videos about early numeracy measures and the Urja, she was doing all the scoring. So now you're going to watch a set of videos for your workbook activity number four and you're going to score each early numeracy measure. So on these videos we've actually kind of videoed what the student is seeing and you're going to hear the student read the numbers aloud or decide which number is greater or figure out the number in the missing sequence and then you have the score sheet and you're going to score and figure out what the student's score would be for number identification, for quantity discrimination, and for missing number. So now, when I say begin, I want you to tell me what number is in each box. You're going to start here and go across the page. Try each one. If you come to one that you don't know, I'll tell you what to do, okay? Uh, do you have any questions? No? Okay. So, let's put your finger on this first one. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, begin. 6, 4, 2, 9, 16, 5, 81, 8, 3, 9, 8, 26, 0, 18, 30, 16, 2, 18, 94, 17, 22, 7, 64, 47, 9, 1, 34, 24, 97, Okay, keep going. 11, 53, 49, 51, 20, 42, 14, 3, 0, 6, 11, 10, 4, 3, 13, 8, 0, 20, 49, 57, 1, 12, 42, 3, 11, 43, 33. Great job. 382, 0. When I say begin, I want you to tell me which number is bigger. Okay, you're going to try each one. If you come to one that you don't know, I'll tell you what to do. Okay, we're going to go across the page. Are you ready? Go. 5, 7, 8, 18, 10, 8, 16, 9, 10, 6, 14, 9, 12, 15, 10, 17, 6, 10, 15, 6, 5. Very good. 8, 9, 16, 9, 8, 19, 1, 5, 10, 16, 14, 2, 10, 7, 8, 9, 12, 9, 18, 13, 17, 8, 15, 18, 18, 9, 7, 8, 15, 8, 14, 10, 8. You are amazing!
Okay, so when I say begin, I want you to tell me what number goes in the blank in each box. You're going to start here and go across the page, okay? Um, if you try each one, if you come to one you don't know, I will tell you what to do. Are you, do you have any questions? Okay, put your finger on the first one. Ready, begin. 10, 6, 5, 60, 4, 6, 2, 20, 9, 3, 9, 7, 25, 8, 1, 6, 5, 8, 2, 0, 60, 7, 45, 7, Six, four, one, ten, forty, sixty, two, four, three, nine, eight, one. All right, good job working on the early numeracy measures. Now we're gonna talk about computation measures. So computation measures, they uh, are a measure where the student works on grade level computation items for a set amount of time. And usually the, this is a pretty brief amount of time. It's not one minute like the early numeracy measures. Usually the time limits are anywhere from two to six minutes. And that, difference, uh, that differs based on the different types of progress monitoring measures that you're using and the different grade levels levels of materials that you're using. Now the nice thing about computation measures is because students work on these independently and they actually do the writing on this page right here, you can administer these to a group. So you can administer them to a small group or if you want to, to an entire classroom and then you score them after administration has ended. So speaking of that scoring, when we're thinking about computation measures, Students can earn one point for each problem answered correctly. All right, so that's a way that we can score these. But a better way to score these is students receive one point for each digit answered correctly. So we have two ways, by problems correct or by digits correct. And then the number of correct answers, either the number of problems correct or the number of digits correct, is the student's score, uh, and that's what would go on the student's graph. Now you might say, why Sarah, why is digits correct better? That sounds like that's a little bit more complicated. Well, it is a little bit more complicated, but it's a much better way to score these. It's much more sensitive to student learning. Let me show you what I mean. So I've got the three problems here and they have been solved three different ways. So I have 6,709 minus 4,523. And for this one, the student answered 2,186. If you do the math on this problem, that is the correct answer. So if I was scoring this by problems correct, the student would get one point. But if I scored it by digits correct, the student would get four points, all right? May not make much of a difference when the problem is answered correctly. But look at the examples when the student has made a mistake. So for in this example, the student answered the thousands column correct, the tens column, and the ones column correct, but they made a mistake in the hundreds column. So if I was scoring this as problems correct, the student would score a zero. But do you think zero really represents the, what the student knew in this problem? I don't, I don't think so. If I score this by digits correct, the student answered three digits correct. So they really answered 75% of the problem correct, they made a mistake right here. So if I score by digits correct, it's not really uh, criticizing them for answering the hundreds column incorrect. It's saying, wow, look, look how well you did with all of the other uh, place values. And if in this example, um, if I scored by problems correct, the student would have a zero. Um, but if I scored by digits correct, the score would be a two. Now, a problems correct is easier. It's very easy to be like, yes, that's correct, or no, that's incorrect. Uh, digits correct takes a little bit more time scoring, but actually once you do it a few times, you fall into a pattern and it's, it's quite easy to score by digits correct. But it does give you a much better idea of what the student really knows in the problem. So you can see for this example, instead of saying, you got a zero, 
I could give the student three points. In this example, instead of saying you have a zero, I can give the student two points because they answer two digits correct. Now here are some exa other examples of computation measures. You can see that we don't see a ton of variability in these measures from uh, progress monitoring company to progress monitoring company. Um, all of these are asking students to add, subtract, multiply, and divide and work on grade level appropriate computation items. So this example here is from grade one. You'll notice that these are the expectations that we would have for students if they were in first grade and asked to solve different addition and subtraction problems. Uh, you will not see any multiplication or division in first grade. But if I pop over here, this is a third grade example. And so I will start to see multiplication and division problems because that is expected of third grade students. So now I want you to look at this computation measure. A student has answered the problems on this assessment. I want you to score this measure in two ways so you can really get a good idea of how it, what it's like to score by problems answered correctly and then what it's uh, like to score by digits answered correctly. And then I want you to look at the student's graph and score and, and plot their score on the student graph. Let's talk about concepts and application measures. So here's an example of a concepts and application measure. And you'll probably be like, whoa, that looks quite different from the computation measure you just showed me, Sarah. And I will say, yes, it does look quite different. So these concepts and applications measures, they measure application type problems from the grade level, um, the, from the year long grade level curriculum. Um, they're administered for a set amount of time, usually ranging from five to eight minutes. It might be a little bit less depending on the progress monitoring measure, could be a little bit more. And they are, can be group administered. So you can administer them to a small group or a whole class and you score them after administration. But what you'll notice about this concepts and applications measure is that it applies computation skill in a variety of ways. So if we look at these problems, I see a geometry problem. Here I see a problem where students are required to estimate. Um, here are students, uh, another geometry problem where students are asked about um, but different parts of a circle. Here is a kind of, it's kind of a typical word problem. Then I look over here, I'm figuring out the average, talking about different prime numbers, another type of word problem, and talking about place value. So these are applying students' math skill in a variety of areas. And when I think about areas of mathematics, I'm thinking about numbers and operations, geometry, measurement, algebra, and data analysis, almost all concepts and applications measures will ask students to solve problems in those different areas of mathematics. Now, when we're thinking about scoring concepts and applications measures, students can receive one point for each blank answered correctly. So you'll see here that problem number one actually has three blanks. So I would see whether blank, the first blank is correct, whether the second blank is correct, and whether the third blank is correct. And so I can score the measure um, accordingly. And then the number of correct answers within the time limit is the student's score, and that's what would go on the student's graph. And remember, we're gonna talk about graphing just a little bit later. Now here are some other examples of concepts and applications measures. Um, this one comes from eighth grade, so you can see we even have some questions about the Pythagorean theorem. Um, this one comes from grade two. We actually already looked at this one a little bit earlier, um, but we can see that students are asked about a variety of second grade mathematics skills. So what I would like you to do now is look at this concepts and applications measure, and I'd like you to score it. So we provide a score sheet, and we've got the student work. I want you to score the measure, and then I want you to graph the student's score on their graph. So in this part of this module, we've been talking about administering and scoring progress monitoring measures. And I want you to think that early numeracy measures are for students that aren't really ready for addition and subtraction. So for those students that are in kindergarten or first grade, or students maybe in later grades who are really still having difficulty with early numeracy skills. When we think about computation measures and concepts and applications measures, those can be used for any students really across grades one through eight. 
And when I talk about computation and concepts and applications, and even when I talk about the early numeracy measures, um, I talked about three early numeracy measures and computation and concepts and applications, kind of talked about them together. But I want you to remember that you only have to administer one of these measures. Um, it's not really necessary to administer any more than one. That's going to take up more time. And most often within intensive intervention, you're administering your progress monitoring measure as part of your intensive intervention time. So we really want that progress monitoring measure to be as brief as possible. When we do tutoring in Texas, when we do progress monitoring, we always administer the measure on the last day of tutoring within the week. So if the last day of tutoring is Thursday or Friday, the first thing that the students do is do a progress monitoring measure with us. Um, that might be a, a practice that you might want to adopt. But remember, you just need one measure. You want to administer it every week. And then you're going to use those scores to determine how well students are responding to your intensive intervention. So we've got to um, think about, we're also going to think about the fidelity of the administration of the measures. So when we're administering these measures, we need to administer them as the test developers tell us to administer them. So if there are directions, those directions need to be read verbatim. If it says time for three minutes, guess what? You need to time for three minutes. And you also need to score them as directed. If it says to score by blanks correct or digits correct, you want to score by blanks correct or digits correct. Because then you can take those scores and compare those scores against any national uh, norm scores that are provided with, along with the progress monitoring measure. Now, our next activity is going to be looking at one of the tools charts that's available on the, on the, national, on the national Center for Intensive Interventions website. Now, I want you to always be thinking about several things when we're thinking about progress monitoring measures. We want progress monitoring measures to be reliable and valid, and we want them to have alternate forms. And you might say, well, how do I know that? Well, the National Center for Intensive Intervention, their tools chart, which we found by going to tools chart and then clicking on academic progress monitoring, they sift through all of this information for us. So remember, one of the things we talked about a little bit earlier were uh, general outcome measures versus mastery measures. So we want to use general outcome measures for progress monitoring. Um, you may be teaching uh, elementary or middle school, so you're going to select grade. We can also want to select math to make sure we're focusing on math measures. But when I talk about reliability and validity in alternate forms, that information is provided in these tabs here. So we got uh, information about reliability under psychometrics, information about alternate forms under progress monitoring, and information about how to use progress monitoring data and within database individualization under this tab right here. So for your workbook activity, you are going to fill in a table about the mathematics progress monitoring measures that are available uh, for you and the grade levels that you teach. So some of you might be teaching second grade, so you're going to look at second grade measures. Some of you might be teaching sixth grade, so you're going to look for sixth grade measures. But then I want you to fill in what are the psychometrics of the measures that you're looking at, what are the progress monitoring properties of the measures that you're looking at, and also what are the database individualization properties of the, uh, of the measures that you're looking at. So to review, I want you to remember that we can't do data-based individualization without progress monitoring, and that progress monitoring needs to occur regularly with some type of progress monitoring measure, just maybe the ones that we just talked about. But that progress monitoring is important to help make determin de determinations of response or non-response here. And if it's not, if a student is non-responsive, remember we do that diagnostic assessment we make adaptations, and we continue to progress monitor here and determine response or non-response. So if I'm thinking about my checklist for this part of our module, remember our original question was how do we administer progress monitoring measures with fidelity? Well, first we have to select progress monitoring measures that are reliable and valid and have alternate forms. Why do they have to have alternate forms? Because we're going to use them week after week, and we want to compare scores from one week to the next to the next and to the next. We want to administer those progress monitoring measures with fidelity. Some of you might be in administering early numeracy measures. Others of you might be in administering concepts and applications measures. But you're always going to administer those as the test developers have asked you to, and you're going to score those in the same way. 
And then you're going to score those progress monitoring measures and graph those student scores. And that uh, kind of blends us into the next part of this module where we're going to look at graphing scores and how do we make decisions about whether the students are responding to the intensive intervention or whether they're not responding to the intensive intervention. Now, so far in this module, we've asked you to reflect upon the progress monitoring practices that you have available to you in your school. We've also asked you to reflect upon diagnostic assessments. Um, but I want you to think really uh, focus in right now just on the progress monitoring practices. So you've already done a survey. So I want you to do a journal entry about what measures are available to you and how are you going to administer those measures with fidelity. I want you to think about what measures would you like to use. So what would you like your school to purchase or what maybe you, might you purchase or get your hands on. Um, how could you improve your progress monitoring practices? Maybe you need a better data management system or maybe you need help with the interpretation of the data. And then I also want you to think about why have we been talking so much about progress monitoring? So why is progress monitoring an essential part of DBI?